Friends, as we enter Christ's Passion together, we're going to pick up in the Gospel of Mark, beginning in chapter 15. And it reads, At daybreak, the chief priests with the elders, legal experts, and the whole Sanhedrin formed a plan. They bound Jesus, led him away, and turned him over to Pilate. And Pilate questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, That's what you say. The chief priests were accusing him of many things, and Pilate asked him again, Aren't you going to answer? What about all these accusations? But Jesus gave no more answers, so that Pilate marveled. During the festival, Pilate released one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. A man named Barabbas was locked up with the rebels who had committed murder during an uprising. The crowd pushed forward and asked Pilate to release someone, as he regularly did. Pilate answered them, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? He knew that the chief priest had handed him over because of his jealousy. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas to them instead. Pilate replied, Then what do you want me to do with the one that you call king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Why? What has he done? They shouted even louder, Crucify him. Pilate wanted to satisfy the crowd, so he released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus whipped, then handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the courtyard of the place known as the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole company of soldiers. They dressed him up in a purple robe and twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on him. They saluted him, Hey, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck his head with a stick. They spit on him and knelt before him to honor him. When they finished mocking him, they stripped him of the purple robe and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Simon, a man from Cyrene, Alexander and Rufus' father, was coming in from the countryside. They forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Gol Golgotha, which means skull place. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. They crucified him. They divided up his clothes, drawing lots for them to determine who would take what. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The notice of the formal charge against him was written, the King of the Jews. They crucified two outlaws with him, one on his right and one on his left. People walking by insulted him, shaking their heads, saying, Ha! So you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, were you? Save yourself and come down from that, from that cross. In the same way, the chief priests were making fun of him among themselves, together with the legal experts. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross, then we'll see and believe. Even those who had been crucified with Jesus insulted him. From noon until three in the afternoon, the whole earth was dark. At three, Jesus cried out with a large shout, Eli, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you left me? After hearing him, some standing there said, Look, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a pole, offered it to Jesus to drink, saying, Let's see if Elijah will come and take him down. But Jesus let out a loud cry and died. The curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing Jesus saw how he died, he said, This man was certainly God's son. Friends, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It was probably a long night for Jesus even before that day. It was a long day, the scripture tells us, from nine until noon. But drawing from my own experience, being a little vulnerable in this moment, I'll tell you, a night before we ever went out on patrol the next day when I was in Afghanistan, I couldn't sleep. Inevitably, I would always call my wife or somebody the night before just to say hi, see the baby. And I couldn't go to sleep. You would sit there in this empty room thinking about all the worst things that you could think about could happen the next day, right? 
and I couldn't sleep. Every night in perpetual fear of what may be the next day. Inevitably, morning would come. And you do all the same things that you normally did. You wake up, you eat breakfast, you go out there. And then when you see everybody else ready to <laughs> don their gear and go out and do the thing that you had been so afraid to do the night before, you kind of just looked at each other, shrugged and moved on. But I can't imagine what it would have been like the night before to sit in that cell all alone knowing what awaited you the next day. The fear that has to come in. And the disciples, what were they thinking at this time? Jesus had predicted this moment three times in the Gospel of Mark leading up to this point. And every time, they started an argument about who's to be greater. And earlier, just a couple chapters before Jesus is arrested, they're going to get into this argument about, Christ, do this thing that I would ask of you. When you come to sit in your throne in glory, let me sit at your right and your left, as if to say, when you become the king that you've been telling us that you would, let me sit at your right and left. And now he sits in a cell, alone, afraid. And all the disciples scattered. Peter, his best friend, had just denied him three times, leaving him alone. The kingship that they thought that he was coming into was nothing like what Christ was going to show them. The Gospel of Mark is kind of this story, this narrative that takes the Lord Jesus Christ all the way up to his coronation, not on a throne, but a cross. And it's poignant to note that when the disciples are arguing about who gets to sit at his right and left, when he's finally coronated upon the cross with people spitting and he gets the crown that he knew that he had to take, the people on his right and left were two criminals. Recently, my middle son uh, has taken to uh, waking up in the middle of the night because he's afraid of the dark. And Luke will tell you that. He'll be the first one to tell you. So I did everything I could to uh, get Christmas lights that strand and get plugged into the wall and I wrapped them around the top bunk of his bed uh, so that he could see them. We've even made a fort over the top of his bed so that the light wouldn't bother James who sleeps in the same room. But even the light sometimes is not enough and you hear the little door creak open and you hear those words, Dad. And you try to do what you can, you go back and Say, buddy, it's going to be okay. There's no noises in here. It's going to be okay. Until one night, I grabbed Luke by the hand and put him back underneath the fort and made sure his Christmas lights were arranged just so and crawled into bed with him. Put my hand on his back and we just said a little prayer together. We talked about how Jesus had calmed the storms of life and how his room in that moment could just be this crazy storm that was just scaring him. But Jesus was with us in this boat. There's something that we've missed in this past year, perhaps more than anything. And it's this human contact. And I think in that moment, right, Luke needed me to have skin in the game of his fear. Not to simply put up Christmas lights and go back down into my bed and sleep comfortably. But to take his fear upon my shoulders and crawl into bed with him and tell him, put my hand upon his back and tell him it's going to be okay. I've been scared too. There were many nights when I couldn't sleep either. You see, the throne that the disciples wanted to put Jesus on in the Gospel of Mark was some distant thing. But the throne Jesus crawls up onto and he's nailed to at the very end of this text is one that shows us that our Savior has skin in the game. And maybe you're going through something today. 
Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Maybe it's a divorce. Maybe it's the storm within your own life. And there's probably 8, 9, 15, 20, I don't know how many different kinds of sermons that you could preach but I always about the cross, but as I always tell people, it depends on which angle that you're looking at it. And there's many different times where I needed to see the cross of Jesus Christ. To see His skin in the game of my pain and my suffering. To know that He's right there with me. And maybe that's what you need to hear this Good Friday. And knowing that when we come out on the better side of this pandemic, it's time for us to be, get back to the kind of human contact that Jesus Christ showed us. One of love, one of mercy, one of compassion, one that says, I care about you and I love you and I'm ready to shoulder your cross with you. I come out here on Good Friday in the morning. To show that as lonely as that morning was for Jesus Christ that day, to feel all alone. That we know the sun rises on the other side, but He woke up that lonely morning to show us that He has skin in the game. And just like I needed to wake up and feel my brothers and sisters to my right and left ready to march on and do the hard things that we were asked to do, just like Luke needed his dad to come up and just put his hand on his back. Jesus had you in mind when he woke up. Although it was a sleepless night, he had you in mind as he walked that place to the skull as he stood silent before Pilate so that he would be amazed. He had you in mind. That's my message for you this Good Friday, friends. To remind you that the suffering servant, Jesus Christ, has skin in the game. And he went up on that cross because of you and because of me. Tremble, tremble.